So my number five WTF moment, Larry, <laughs> was this best right here. So you've got Kev's stepmom uh-huh. that just married his mother, okay? And she went on the streets. And what we didn't know was that they have an app that was attached to Keisha's phone. So right. they know exactly where Keisha's phone was at. It was last at the bus stop. But she goes on the street underneath the bridge where old rusty ass Ronnie is located. And she knows that the phone is there somewhere. And so as she's interrogating people, she runs across Ronnie. She says, I know who the hell you are, Ronnie. Everybody know who you is. Where's that phone? And something me and Larry said last week, they might try to turn Ronnie into a hero because he's had these issues in the past with killing people. And sure enough, indeed, they begin that road by having Ronnie beat up the other homeless dude to get the phone. That's my number five. Larry, expand on that whole sequence. Yeah, I think that was interesting. We kind of knew this is that 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 storyline was coming because in one of the trailers leading up to the show starting, they were saying they show they they show him getting baptized and in a uh, voiceover saying, I think it's my mission to find this girl. So we mm-hmm. knew that there was going to be something going on like that with him. And whether or not he actually finds her or not, he's going to definitely be integral into that story and that, that particular storyline. So, you know, it, the thing I found interesting was his friends who, you know, he meets up. It seems like, you know, those have been boys for a long time and they meet up at that bar and drink. And they were like, show us where you live. And he was like, nah, whatever. And then when they went down there, and they were like, dude, what are you doing? You can come sleep on my couch or whatever. And he was like, nah, this is where I belong. These are my these are my people. And then as he walked down there and his boys were seeing him and they were like, everybody was like, what's up, Ronnie? How you doing? People were dapping him up, giving him pounds. He was like the man down there. And, you know, I guess it's one of those things. It's like maybe it's better to be a, a, a big fish in a little pond than, you know, the little fish in a big pond. So, it was just interesting. His boys seemed like they were having fun because they were down there playing dominoes and chilling with them. And and so, you know, it's it was it's interesting to see how all that's gonna play out. And uh, you know, we I I, I think it's gonna be something. I wouldn't be surprised if Ronnie was the one that actually found her. I hope he doesn't get killed, but something leads me to believe that his redemption story is gonna come to, with his demise at the end of this. Like he's gonna find her. And in the midst of finding her, he's going to lose his life in the process. Mm-hmm. So, Now, by the way, everybody that's checking in, Diamond Girl checked in to check us out live. What's up, Diamond Girl? Comment, any, comment anything you want to know about what we're covering today. And in terms of that storyline, I think that was all about Ronnie more so than anyone else and where they're trying to take his character. But the question I'll pose to everyone watching this and people that are going to leave comments when I re-upload this as a single video. Are we so far beyond Ronnie that they can't turn him around to be a protagonist? Is he that far gone? And I'll leave it at that. I'm going to leave it at that. So, Larry, we'll go to number four. All right. (laughs) The number four WTF moment on this particular episode was my man Jake getting a chance to meet his brother Trig. And the whole <laughs> the whole exchange between these two was Trig is getting into his life and he wants Jake to come stay with him. And Jake's like, nah, Duda's got me. But you can already see that there's friction being caused between Duda and Jake. And at the end of that conversation, Trig said, do you want me to just go away? Jake said, no, you can stay, but I'm not moving. I'm not ready to move in with you, but we can start a relationship. To me, that's just sowing the seeds of dissension between Jake and Duda and what likely might become a standoff between Trig and Duda. Let's not forget, Trig took Duda's money last week. And having said that, Larry, I give it to you. What are your thoughts on what they're trying to build with that plot? Well, you know, I think eventually... Yes, I don't know. It's hard to say. Part of me feels like maybe eventually he'll go with Trig. I don't know. But I'll tell you, the thing that I found really interesting about that scene was is that it reminded you just how young those boys are. Because mm-hmm. often we see them, and as people do in this country anyways, we often age up black people. They age up black boys. They age up black girls. Mm-hmm. And 
And when you see them, you know, they're hanging out, they're smoking weed, they're messing with girls to, and, and all the stuff that you would think of maybe as like older high school kids. And then you remember they're not even in, they're not even in high school yet. They're still in middle school. You know, it's like these kids are like, like what Kev had to roll up to Keisha's high school. Cause he doesn't even go there yet. You know? So it, it's just, it's a, uh, it's, it's, that that scene reminded me just how young they were. And when I saw when I saw the young man, it just reminded me how vulnerable he is and, mm -hmm. and how young he is. And and yeah, it, that's a tough one. I mean, part of part of me is like you want him to make the right decision, and and family oftentimes could be a good thing. The guy obviously wants him. He seems like he wants him for the right reasons, but he's not. A, he's not a good guy. He's not innocent. I mean, the, the opening scene to introducing this dude, he basically blasted some guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just straight busted on dudes in his head and killed him like it was nothing, had a conversation with Duda, with Duda and then walked away. It was like, what the, you know? So Well, having said that, Duda ain't no better. I no, mean, Duda's terrible. Yeah, we, we know about Duda, but the one thing that it looks like Duda is taking a pretty bad parenting choice with Jake. Um, he's not exercising in that little exchange where Jake walked in with his shoes on. Yeah. You know, he kind of got on Jake in a dismissive manner. It wasn't any, it, that wasn't done out of love. That wasn't done per se out of respect. That was just more, you know, you little whippersnapper, you getting the hell on my nerve with my pristine floor type yeah. thing. And it comes down to which one do we feel is the lesser of two evils that's going to really sacrifice themselves for Jake. And as of right now, it seems the storyline is showing that maybe Trig is the one that can be that would sacrifice his own life for Jake's more so than Duda. Because I think without a yeah. doubt, if we had to pick, Duda will not sacrifice himself for Jake. But no, it I don't seems, think he'll sacrifice himself mm -hmm. for anybody. But it seems like right now at this moment, maybe Trig would do. And yeah. that that leads me to Larry. This is going to be your yeah. hot button. Hold go on, ahead. before we go, before you move yeah. on, there was one other thing I wanted to say about that exchange with Jake and Dudo when he came in the house with his shoes on. This mm -hmm. is something that it's not just about them, but something more broad that I've that I've I've seen with, with black folks, which when you know I grew up in a predominantly white area. And so when I started to have more black friends when I got a little bit older and started going to their homes, one thing I noticed is, is that there was this clear divide where parents clearly said, This is my house you're living under my roof you're living in my house and that was something that i hadn't really experienced when i was younger and growing up and and went to other because and when with white families it was always about you know this is our house you know don't do anything to to break or destroy or disrespect our house you live in our house and and i think that i think this this attitude of this is my house and don't you don't have the right to wear your shoes on my floors or do whatever you do under my roof. I think that sets up a, a psychological sense of insecurity with kids that all the, where they never feel safe. Like it's not really theirs. They can never fully depend on this being there for them because it's not theirs. It's, it's their parents. And when someone constantly is reinforcing the fact that it's theirs and not yours, it makes you feel unsafe in that space because it can be taken away from you at any moment and it's just one of those little small things that that you notice sometimes when you get to peek on both sides of the fence and and you know i think those things really mess with kids and i think us our kids have so many other things externally externally we have to deal with it's important to try and make them feel as safe as we possibly can when they're in the, their own walls so well, that's what i meant when i said he didn't he didn't highlight in a discerning patient manner the right. importance of why you take off your shoes right now with us getting ready to have this baby next week uh yeah i want her to understand that this is our house but at right. the same time she needs to understand that there are two people that set rules and guidelines in this house and that's me and her mother and right. that's not but you do share this space that we all call a home and that's what i meant when i said he didn't handle jake that situation i don't feel like he handled jake in a discerning loving manner that's all right. I'm saying. No, you're right. I think he could have just, I think simply saying, hey, you remember, we don't wear our shoes inside the inside our home.
And I think simply changing the language in his tone would have would have gotten through to him. Instead, he did. I mean, he took his shoes off. It's not like it's not like he complied. He didn't comply. He did. But I don't think he got through to him the way that he that he intended. So Mm -hmm. but I mean, Duda is a street dude who doesn't really you know, he doesn't always deal with with subtlety and, and, and whatever. So, I mean, he's just sort of a. You know, even though he wears suits and tries to, to to play the role of a polished, you know, a polished diamond, he's basically just a piece of coal. You know, Dang. Poor fella, yeah. you just you just want to throw him into the coal factory so he can be burned up for Duke <laughs> Energy. Poor fella, <laughs> Lord have mercy. Moving on to the number three WTF moment, and this is the one y'all been waiting to hear Larry Spaz on number oh, three WTF go. moment. The big reveal that Trigg's girlfriend is really transitioning. And it all comes to a head when they go to a gay club. And in the gay club, this cat right here is pushing up on Trigg. And Trigg snapped a little bit, told him to get out of my face. and was about to beat the brother up. Then the girlfriend stepped in, had a talk with him. And basically said, just because you're uncomfortable with who I really am, highlights another issue. For me, it basically said that he has some issues knowing that his woman is transitioning from man to woman because of the way he spazzed out. And Larry pointed this out last week, that he felt like this young lady was a trans individual. And it was made clear in this episode she is. But one other point that was highlighted by a lot of people is the love scene that Trig had with this individual. So, Larry, do you feel like they set this up in a manner where it shows an insecurity in Trig and the way he went off during that scene in the in the in the bar? Yeah, I mean, he's obviously he obviously has some some insecurities about about that. I think because you know, like he said, he you know, and I don't know if. Um, I don't know the I don't know the circumstances for which they met. So I don't know if maybe they met while he was in prison or something, or if they met afterwards or whatever. And he maybe thought she was a woman, and then you know later she told him. I don't know what the I don't know what the the, the circumstances were, but obviously he said, "When I look at you, I don't see anything but a woman. All I see is just one hundred percent woman." And, you know, but it, it's for me, it's confusing in some respects because you have you have some you have some trans people that say I'm woman. You can't like I am just a woman like you should not refer to me as anything other. I am just a woman. Well, if you're with a if you're if you're with a guy and he sees you as a woman, you want him to see you as just a woman. I'm not sure you should be so offended that he that he got upset that a, that a gay dude came and tried to get at him because if he's, if you view yourself as a woman, you want him to view you in the same way. Well, he's thinking of himself as heterosexual. And so if he thinks of himself as heterosexual, he shouldn't be comfortable with a gay guy coming and trying to get at him. Just like, I don't think a gay person is going to be comfortable with a straight person trying to get with them, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, that that part's a little bit. That's one of those things to me that feels a little a little hypocritical in some respects. But I I get it that I'm not I'm not trans. I'm not gay. I don't understand their experience entirely. I try and understand. I try and listen. And you know. And unfortunately, I'm going to say some things probably that will offend people throughout time because until I can get a full grasp of the of the you know, of, and maybe I'll never get a full grasp, but until I get enough of a grasp, I'm going to keep saying stupid stuff until I can get a better understanding because that's part of my journey to understand. But, you know, for me, I think he could have just handled that so much better. I mean, for me, right. I've all, like, I've, I've gone to gay bars with, with, cause I have, I had an ex-girlfriend who had a gay friend. She went, he wanted to go out and she wanted to go out with them. So we all went out and, I just simply found the path of least resistance, which was just simply to say, I'm sorry, I'm here with somebody. So I didn't feel the need to try to explain to somebody I'm I, I'm straight and not gay and leave me alone. I, I mean, I'm in their space. And, you know, and so just simply saying I'm here with somebody was enough. You know, I mean, I don't want to 
I mean, it would be crazy. Could you imagine if you went if some if somebody brought a a racist person to a black club or a black bar and somebody went to go try and talk to them and they were like, uh, I don't talk to I don't talk to to, to niggers, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That shit would be horribly offensive. It would be terrible. You're like, why are you up in here if you feel like a certain way about black people? Why are you even in here? You right. know? So I to me, like- he just handled it all wrong. He could have just did. taken the path of least resistance. Just say, I'm here with somebody. I'm sorry. And let it be. And if, and if at that point, if you tell this person you're here with somebody and they persist, that's when you go talk to your, your partner and you say, hey, you need to handle this before I do. Because at that point, you know, it's not just it's not just them disrespecting you by them by by them pursuing you after you told them you're already here with someone but they're also disrespecting your partner too so you know well um you know the old people tell me a hit dog will holler and yeah. so much of his aggression i think was insecurities within him um after he pushed homeboy that was aggressive let's not let's not forget that homeboy was very aggressive I mean, it was like he had just dropped two Viagras. He was so aggressive. And after the push, he should have stopped right there. He didn't need to persist to beating him up. But I think they put that in there to highlight that he's a hit dog and he's hollering. He's got deep insecurity issues dealing with his girlfriend because in the back of his mind, he knows that she is originally a man and he's trying to come to grips with just burying that part and just looking at her for being a woman, but he's still wrestling with it. And I'm, I'm, I'm about thinking they're gonna, they're gonna go through that line again throughout this season because that was such a big issue in this past episode. But right. like I said, my grandma always said, I "Hit dog a holler," and if well, that's gonna, going, it's go gonna ahead. have to come out because they're up there. I mean, they 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 already have an issue between the two of them where she's saying, you know, she was she was upset already with him because he didn't want to go out in public really with her. Like he didn't want to go out. They didn't want to go out to clubs or bars or stuff because, you know, he's worried about them being seen together. And, and I mean, this is a dude that's like a street dude that's murdering people and he's rolling around with a trans woman. People, of course, the streets are not going to be kind. If they see anything that they can use against you as weakness, they're going to take that opportunity to use it. And if they think that for you, for, you know, for trig, if they think that is, is attacking his manhood or his or his you know his heterosexuality they're going to attack that and you know so i i mean but you i mean i i regardless i know people want i know people want to say oh trans women are women and they want to they want to talk all this but here's the thing if you are if you are a man you are a straight man and you are having sex with someone who also has a penis you are going to question your sexuality. It is not possible not to because you are having sex with a, another person with a penis and people understand that to be homosexuality. And so people are not going to look at it as and say, oh, this person's still still hetero. They're not gay because they're having sex with someone who, who dresses like a woman and acts like a woman and sounds like a woman and, and identifies with a woman as a woman. They're not going to, they're not going to, most people aren't going to see that and hear that internally, nor are most people outside going to see and hear that. What they're going to see and hear is that he's sleeping with another human being that also has a penis. Well, let, let me give you some perspective from people I've talked to in the jail. Um, because Trick's character is fresh out the pen. Right. A lot of dudes that go to jail and have long sentences say that they have sexual interaction with men in there but they don't consider that to be a gay act. And when they come out, they go right back to women. Could that have been the issue with Trig in this situation? And like you said, maybe the person he's with now, they started out a woman and decided, I mean, started out a man and decided to transition once, you know, they got out of prison or he got out of prison, what may have you. So that will bring up a whole nother can of worms. Yeah, but here's the thing when you have situations like that, and I've heard people, I've heard people that have been in prison say the same thing. And I think this is part of the problem is that in this country and well, not just in this country, all over the world, being gay is if you're a man is considered being less of a man, Mm -hmm. that you are not really a man if you are gay. And that is just that is the way that it is looked at in most societies in this country, in this world. 
And and so if you go to jail and you're looked at as and, and you're up there having sex with a man and you would and all of a sudden you're saying, well, I guess I'm gay. That means you're going to be viewed as less of a man. You're going to view yourself as less of a man, which is going to make you a target. And so, I mean, I hear people make up all kinds of craziness. Guys will make up all kinds of stupid reasons to try and try and, you know, rationalize their homosexual behavior. You hear people say stuff like, oh, I'm not gay because I don't give I don't take it. I just give it like that was the thing that what's his name? Liberace's boyfriend had said, no, I'm not gay because I only I only give it. I don't take it, you know. No, I've never, I don't, I, I've never sucked dick. I only let people suck my dick. So I'm not gay. I mean, that's just, that's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I understand that people rationalize stuff in their own mind so that they can, so that they can justify to themselves why they do what they do. But part of me thinks like, wouldn't you just be happier if you just, you know, if you just went ahead and accepted the idea that maybe you are bisexual, you know, or maybe you actually are gay? You know, it doesn't, it, I mean, I don't think that, I don't think being gay or being bisexual makes someone less of a man. I, I have right. seen people who, who have been out there, I've, you know, growing up in California, you know, West Hollywood was filled with gay people. I've seen straight dudes get their ass mollywopped by a freaking gay dude, you know? So, I mean, it does not, if that is, I mean, it, I've, I've seen, you know, we, we see gay guys out there that, that work in all levels of corporate America. They work in jobs that, that are that are typically looked at as regular macho jobs. They do all kinds of things. They are just men who have a different sexual preference. And so I don't think that simply deciding that you want to sleep with someone of the same sex makes you less of a man. And I think if most people would just go ahead and accept, okay, I like this or I like this and this is not going to all of a sudden make you less of a man and then they might be act they might actually be happier but moving right along wtf number two and this one is kind of funny but brutally sad all at the same time we have emmett's mama jada and i mentioned in the trailer review whose strong manly hands was these well we find out in this episode that those strong manly hands was the masseuse that was recommended by Emmett's baby mama. And it's this dude right here. And during the massage, he's giving Jade, he's giving Jada, who is very lonely and is looking for some love, a great massage. He gets a little erection. And next thing you know, she starts smiling. He on top of her, doing the happy ending, only for him to be leaving. See Emmett. Emmett knows him. They dap each other up. They talk about his job and how much ends he's making, being a masseuse that performs happy endings. And then he like to got his ass whipped and he runs away. Larry, this dude was wrong for that. You don't think he knew this was Emmett's mama? I don't think he knew. I don't think he knew. But I think when he because when he found out, dude got ghost. He, he didn't wait gone. to try to explain. He just like he said when Emmett said, "That's my mama." Dude broke left. <laughs> I, he he straight out ran Emmett with his his massage table and everything. everything. He Lord, was dude, gone. He was gone. He was he man. He was he was out, out that piece. I so, I mean, well, let's give this. Let's gross, give this. It's kind of gross thinking about it. That 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 his Emmett's girlfriend probably right. had the same experience with you. Exactly. What what are they what are they called when they say when you something but when you're something brothers or something but I mean it's just it's nasty to think that you have like a a degree or to a separation between you and your own mom sexually. That's just ugh. I mean, because dude smashed your mom and he smashed your girl. It's just ugh. it's the thing is, is Emmett gonna find out that dude smashed his girl? He already know dude smashed the mom. Now, I'm thinking that they showed more of that interaction, more so along the line for Jada, because we know she's going to be dating some, it looks like he's a Puerto Rican gentleman or something throughout the series. But the fact that she's lonely and she's vulnerable, I wonder, is this a big reveal for something deeper that's going to happen with Jada's character? So that's what I kind of gather from this, that what is going to be the big reveal 
or the blinder spot she's going to have when they have her finally get into a relationship with the uh, Puerto Rican gentleman or white gentleman that she's going to be dating later on in the season. It could be. I'll tell you what, I this is something I'm thinking. I would not be surprised if Emmett somehow ended up saving Keisha. Like, like what's his name? Uh, Ronnie may be in the process of getting her, saving her. He may end up getting killed in the process. I think Emmett may actually be there, too. I think Emmett and Keisha might actually end up falling back in love or getting not. Not that they've ever had it, but they might end up getting back together. Because I think the way they, they keep presenting – his baby moms, her attitude is so nasty. There's nothing to like about her. They really seem like they're trying to make the audience not like her, and it's working. And I think they're probably doing that to set Emmett up to be with somebody else. And so, I mean, like, what's her name? The chick that cooks the food. I forgot what uh, Lala. I forgot what they gave named her character. But her name is Dom. But we're gonna definitely talk about them in a few. Right. But I think you know, I she's there. But I think I think what's gonna happen is I think that they're gonna. I think I think Emmett might end up getting with Keisha by the end of this thing if he saves her, and 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 that'll be you know the he'll end his relationship obviously with his baby mamas. But I mean, so what? He ends up not being with her. He's already got like four kids. He's not with the other baby mom, so you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll keep an eye on what's going to happen to Miss Jada and the number one WTF moment. You guys, she hasn't answered any of my calls or texts is this one right here. My man, Kevin. Kev got hoard. Grows a big pair. Rolls up to the so-called boyfriend of his sister. He got the information from his sister's friend at school. He rallies the truth. Jake, Papa, they roll up on this dude who eating cereal at the door looking like a fake-ass Cameron. And he was like, I am not leaving till you tell me about my sister. Homeboy pulls gun on people who's like six feet shorter than him just to show you how tough he really is and they let the scene go off without us finding out what's going on hell kevin even tried to walk up in the house showing love to his sisters larry what did this let us know is going on with kevin and the rest of the crew as this thing is going to keep looking for his sister keisha yeah i think for one it just shows us that they're going to make kevin you know Kev, he's he's going to be He's gonna be out there in them streets, and he might he might have to put in some work when it comes to finding his sister. I think it's gonna. I think that hopefully it doesn't lead him to a bad place where he starts doing dirt. But it really does show that this dude, this kid, has a lot of heart. And and the thing that got me when I was watching this scene, I was thinking to myself, you know, <clears throat> why would dude pull a gun on him? I mean, when you're when you have somebody as big as Duda, as that that's big in them streets. You know, he's running for mayor, and you know Jake is, you know, I mean, everybody looked, as far as I know, they think Jacob was like his son. He lives with him. I mean, you're going to pull a gun on those three kids, and, and, and Jake is one of those three? I mean, you might as well just go ahead and just and ask to be killed. Because if mean, you but, actually shot one of them, Duda would have had that whole house burned down with them dudes in it. Well, home, homeboy is potentially the leader of whatever this gang is in Chicago. You know, Duda, Duda owns his section of the city. Apparently, this guy got his section of the city, and he's got his hitters. So maybe he's an adversary to Duda anyway and don't give a you-know-what. Yeah, but I don't feel like Duda's like that. I feel like Duda is like – like these dudes have their street-level stuff. I think Duda's on a different level than these dudes because he's up there trying to – like he's running legit businesses. He's talking about running for mayor. And if I'm not mistaken, Duda was, was like supplying all these dudes. He's been supplying all these street dudes. So it's like these guys are down here dealing, running the streets, making a little money. And dude is up here bringing all this. He's the one bringing the stuff in and distributing it out. And so I don't know. I could be wrong, but I'm just thinking like if 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 that dude had had actually pulled the trigger or if, you know, if even if if dude finds out, dude pulled a gun on, you know, on Jake and them, I'm thinking, I mean, he's, I think he's got some problems. He might will, man. Um, and that didn't get us any closer to figuring out what's going on with Keisha. They left us on that one as a cliffhanger. But Kev but had will... Yeah, man. Kev, he Kev didn't was even the man. He was, like, I... he was like, I'm not leaving without my sister. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I said, I said in the summer when I, when I was doing these trailer reviews, I said that something's going to make Kev grow up really, really quick. We're seeing that with his sister. And you saw Kevin go through his mind, the situation where he got his sister in trouble, where he took and ate one of the girl's birth control pills as if right. it was a damn Tic Tac. And he had been... <laughs> He had been following that guilt of getting her in trouble ever since and had been covering for her. So I'm sure his heart is really, really deeply involved in this because he kind of covered for where she was going in the first place. 